Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. I am Josh Hayes here with Scott Moon and Matt Heron. We're going to be talking about Scrivener today. This episode is brought to you by Muted Implications by Jay Clifton Slater, who I'm curious if he eats ice cream in the morning when he watches the show, because when we had it on Monday nights, he ate ice cream every show. And I'm wondering how that translated to morning time viewing. I'm pretty sure it still counts. And I think that if we had two shows a day, he'd probably have to eat ice cream, ice cream twice. Like every episode. We'll like just stack it for a Clifton, like yeah. 24 let's, hour stretch. Let's, let's do it. Just... Let's do a, a live Monday marathon and see how much ice cream we can get <laughs> Jay Clifton Slater to eat. <laughs> Oh man, that's cool. Well, uh, we're going to talk about that book a little later on uh, in the show. Um, but today we're going to be talking about Scrivener. Last week we did like the super layman's um, explanation of how we use Scrivener. Very basic. Um, Basically, we confused everybody and yeah. then brought in an expert this week. Last week we screwed everything up, and this week we're fixing it. Yes, um, call, call the pros. And so, if you have questions for uh, Matt today, leave them in the live chat. If we don't get to them during the show, uh, we'll field them uh, to Matt after the show, and we'll get to the answers uh, at some point. And Jay Clifton says, root beer floats in the morning. Root beer floats oh. in the morning. That's, that's actually a phenomenal idea. That is actually because it's ice cream, but not ice cream. <laughs> that way, if somebody says, where's your ice cream? You should be eating ice cream. You say, well, it's right here. It's my root beer float. But if somebody says, how can you how can you eat ice cream in the morning? Say, it's a root beer float. It's not it's true. Ice cream. That's very true. Go either way with it. Let's see. Uh, James McCormick had the first uh, message of uh, the day, so he gets the keystroke medium golf clap of appreciation. Thank you, James, and welcome to everybody in the live chat. James, Unity151 Sci-Fi Booktube. Uh, if you're looking for uh, some neat book reviews on YouTube, look this guy up. He does some really cool work. Um, book reviews. He does spoilers uh, and spoiler-free reviews, and then he does yeah. uh, some weekly book hauls, so that's kind of cool. What's up, Rick? What's up, Jeffrey H. Haskell? Welcome to the live Jeff's got a show. question about the EST, CST, a lot of acronyms. I don't understand it. Why do you guys have EST and CST? Oh, Eastern... Eastern, because no one talks about Pacific time. No one really cares about Pacific time. It's just Eastern and Central. Those are really Pacific. Central. Central is really the only time zone. It's really right. the only one. And then we just put it Eastern in there. Just Pretty to... much everybody's trying to forget about the entire West Coast. <laughs> we don't talk about that time zone <laughs> because of all the drama. <laughs> well, oh, that sorry. and Lauren and and Lauren made me do it. So I had to, I had to put the. I hope we didn't just lose all of our West Coast listeners, yeah. right? Everybody there. on. They're what, gone. They quit. See ya. My bad. My what, bad. what time is it in? P what is it? Eight o'clock. In so, the behind Central. So yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. It's a half an hour after Newfoundland time. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. Newfoundland time. I, is I actually love California. I lived out there for a while, but it seems like now lately, the people I talk to that go out there or have things, it's like just a lot of work. Just to like do normal things. Oh yeah, you I've know never, I've never been. I, I would like to visit at some point, but didn't so I can leave. Uh, but anyway, so what have we been up to uh, this last week? I did a lot of uh, plotting work on Tranquility Two. We are super close to having the first draft done of uh, the first Tranquility book, Blood and Steel. Um, Devin finished up all of his bits last week. Um, and then was like, it's all on you. And I'm like, great. No, I'm sweating and nervous. Um, what else have I done? I, I, I kind of story uh, shopped one of his other book series that he's writing right now. Um, and that was kind of fun. What else did I do last week? Um, finished reading Sphere. It's very interesting, the the writing style of, uh, of back in the day, those thrillers. Because they, they would do... Uh, internal thoughts but not italicized and it was just like in with the text and there was a uh, um a lot of like abrupt action beats like he re he like he climbed up the ladder or he went into another part of the base um very like abrupt wasn't like a flowing thing it was very it's very difficult to to describe but i finished that book um started the thrawn the new thrawn book uh, well, I guess it's not new. It's the first Thrawn book. I think Thrawn Allegiances just came out, but it's the, the one before that. Uh, and that's it, really. Uh, last week sucked for writing. <laughs> I did not get a lot of stuff done. Um, yeah. 
You know, Unity talking about our, our time frame thing again, Unity 151 says it's zero plus or minus because actually, what is that like Greenwich Standard Time? So zero? Is it, yeah. Isn't that where it starts? Greenwich Mean Time. It, it, isn't, a, isn't a prime meridian in, in England someplace? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. So. so sorry. Anyway, but. Goes right uh, into the middle I, of Big Ben. I, I'm really excited about Tranquility, Josh. I can't wait for you guys to put that out. I think it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about uh, plotting uh, during the pre-show. Matt, you mentioned that you don't do a lot uh, of of plotting anymore in your I writing. Used to, yeah, you used to do a ton, like month, like two months to plot a book. But now, I don't know. The the longer I go on, the less I seem to need to plot. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I usually sit down, and I think everybody knows this about me with legal pads, and I'll sit down for like two weeks and just completely plot out a book in two weeks, and uh, and then write it. Um, I don't know. For some reason, if I don't, I'll get to like the back half of the book or the back third of the book. And the idea that I had at the beginning just doesn't fit anymore. And now I've got to figure out where I'm going and figure out why it doesn't work and fix it. And I don't like, I don't like doing all that after I've written 60,000 words. I want to do that on the front half. So I know where it's going. Yeah. Um, but My yeah. problem with outlining is that no matter how much I outline, I always get into it. Then I'm like, no, nothing is going according to the outline. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, the best. Like, is this right? even this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Whose book is this that I'm writing? Because that doesn't <laughs> look like what I started out at all. Does that happen to every book you outline, or just some of them? Well, my 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 process basically, without getting too deep into it, I generally do a. I generally will do an outline that includes the, the beginning, the first quarter, half, and then the, like the last door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I will outline beats and chapters up to the first half, and then I will just start writing. And then right. when I get to the point where I'm feeling sluggish, then I outline the second half of the book because then I know what what came before. So are your guys' endings in your outline like good guys win, bad guys die, and no, I, I usually have an ending like like uh, um, like this character uh, Ron in this in this side project where he says Ron Ron and his family commit to leaving the star system on this. Mm -hmm. or yeah it, or or, or, they, or they they enter the final battle and that'll be like that's like the last point where they could not be in the final battle mm -hmm. and then so then they have to they have to finish that so I'll, I'll i won't really yeah it depends i don't usually have a super super specific ending i, I i've heard lots of people talk about writing the ending first mm -hmm. And I, I just, I think that's a terrible idea. I just need to know where I'm going, right? Like a trajectory. Right. Where's the direction? And once I know the direction I'm pointing in, then I can start writing. And yeah, usually- I'm going to California. Right. Exactly. I'll take, so I'll take roads leading westward. Do you have a clear picture of your ending uh, when you no. start or, or no. do you just have a general- I just have a general idea. Um, and there's no way that, um, like some of the endings that I thought I was going to write, I certainly didn't write, but they kind of ended in the same way in the general sense. Right. Yeah. Like, um, I have a vague idea, but what's important is the direction because otherwise if I don't know where I'm going, I don't know which direction yeah. to start walking. I'll, in, right? I'll, right. I'll have a, yeah, right. I'll, have a prem I'll have a premise for the ending, but I won't have it all new, exactly. all, all the details out. So, uh, so we talked about your outline. What else have you been doing this week? So for me, I'm actually outlining two books at once, something I've never done before. I usually try to focus on one project because with a full-time job, there's just not, a, not that much time for other stuff. But I thought um, I'd started a space opera series this year. I just finished book one and it's with beta readers. So I want to outline the second book of that series and the fourth book of the Gun Files series. And so I'm just kind of switching between them whenever I get stuck on one, hop over to the other. And I think by the end of August, I should have both those outlines done and I can start writing again. How detailed are your outlines when you write them out? Like mine, uh, a lot of times when they start out are very uh, scene specific. And then right. as I, as I write them down on, on legal paper, I, it, it's actually helpful because I can't get super detailed because it takes yeah. a really long time yeah, by hand. And then when I transfer them over to, uh, well, in this case, Google drives, but usually Scrivener, when mm -hmm. I transfer them over to Scrivener, that's when I start kind of like I'll have dialogue in my head that I want the characters to say, I'll add that into the outline and I'll add a whole bunch of other like details oh, into the yeah. outline. No, I don't and, go that deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> much, man. I like when I first started, so I've done 10 books now. When I first started writing, they were like, you know, 6,000, 10,000 word outlines. But as yeah. I've gone on, they've just gotten shorter. So like the one I was working on the space opera yesterday, I have the main conflicts for each character, right? Like what do they want? What's their uh, obstacle? It's a conflict. 
what are they going to do to get there and what's the resolution right just a general idea like like scott said a premise to the ending and then um historically what i've done is from that point once i know the major uh, ideas then i'll go and write scene summaries for each chapter so those go into the, the cards and scrivener and then I just open it and start writing. But I like to have a good outline. But now that outline is not 10,000 words like it used to be. Now it's like three to four pages. Right on. So yeah. a paragraph for each chapter, right? If you're writing single scene chapters, each chapter is a scene. Um, if I write three to four sentences for each chapter and it's logical, I feel good about that. Because all I'm really trying to do is make sure that when I sit down to write, I'm not staring at a blank page going, what the hell am I doing here? Right? Mm -hmm. I got to know and have a goal for what I'm doing. And for some reason, writing synopsis for each scene, that way I can sit down and look at the synopsis and go, okay, I'm writing that and just start typing. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Good the one. other way I did it was I started dictating for the space opera in the fall. And so I would print out the synopsis for like a couple chapters and go on a hike and dictate according to the outline. So it's nice to have the, the outline, like the synopsis, which is, again, just a paragraph for each chapter, just to look at and go, oh, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. And if they went in a different direction, then I adjust the outline as I go. I mean, that's pretty common. The outline is just a plan, but right. uh, like you, Scott, my plans always change. It's not yeah. the same as what I thought it was going to be. I, I yeah. might have the right, you know, monster of the week or the right case or, or the right general plot, but I, I really have no well, clue. The, 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 big old, the biggest single problem I have with that one is, is like, say I have nine points in my outline and in point seven, X is going to happen. And mm -hmm. I'll be writing along, writing along, going down my outline and I'll get to points. I'll get to like six and or, or five even. And naturally what, what I had planned to happen in seven occurs in five. Sure. And then, yeah. and then I go on and then I get, then I get to seven and I'm like, I already did that. I yeah. can't do that again. Or I did yeah. something very similar. So now I don't have an outline for seven and then I'm all screwed up. And then, then I so, just toss it and start writing. <laughs> oh, okay. So you just toss it out. Okay. So some, well, some, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I'll update it, but it gets to be so cluttered. It's easier sure. Well, that's challenging too. If you have like point seven would be like the beginning of the third act, right? The the second plot point where they go from mid, like second it's, act to third act. It, it's worse if somebody else is writing the outline. Like when I worked with Richard Fox, he outlined, and then I wrote from his outline. Yeah. And so um, I would get to points in, in his outline, and he's very strict about you know it's a collaboration and it's for his readers, and and this is exactly where it needs to go. And yep. I get there, I'm like shit. <laughs> that character already died. <laughs> I got to go back and resurrect oh, him. Man. Well, that's one of the reasons I'm doing really super detailed outlines now is because I'm writing with uh, Devin Ford. And so he's writing some of the sections and I'm writing some of the sections. And if we don't both know exactly what's happening, then uh, we actually already had a conflict where he wrote a scene and I wrote the exact same scene, but I didn't know he was writing it. And he didn't know I was writing it and they were both completely different, um, which actually worked out because he had some ideas for the scene that I hadn't thought of yet. And it was super easy to combine them uh, and take bits of both scenes and put them together. So that was kind of cool, but uh, that's pretty cool. What about you, Scott? What have you been up to this week? Uh, just uh, been working on victory day and, um, uh, Expeditionary's War, which is the third book in the Brothers in Arms, and then a little bit of my side project. Uh, getting used to the work schedule. Um, did a little bit better with sleep and just kind of the pattern. So pretty happy about that. And uh, listening to some audiobooks, but mostly I've been really knuckling down on on getting some. I need to get. I have too many projects going at once, so I'm trying to get it back down to one or two. That, that's not like you at all. Yeah, I, if I showed you with a screenshot of the spreadsheet, I rebuilt my, my – <laughs> well, if you look at it, I think uh, – because I, I have a spreadsheet, and I'll do a new tab, and then I'll adjust the spreadsheet how I want to track my words, and I'm up to spreadsheet 66 for the year. Nice. And so I need, to, I need to stop making spreadsheets of my <laughs> word output and stuff and projects in my projects, and so I have them listed, the projects, so I can, like – kind of keep track of all the projects. Well, there's like nine of them. I think you, you, your new year's resolution every year for the past eight years has been no more spreadsheets. Yeah, I can't I die. <laughs> I die. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about our show sponsor real quick and then we'll get into talking about Scrivener. Uh, so I've got a really cool thing this week. Check this out. Boom. 
This week's episode is brought to you by Muted Implications. When this is over, Alirio promised, uh, he paused to spit a glob of crimson mucus on the floor and blink away from the blood from his swollen eye. You and I are going to have a short talk over a pair of long blades. By law, all debts must be paid by the Ides of March. The senior tribune did not care for Centurion Alirio Cicero, and the feeling was mutual. For men like them, steel, sharp steel was the only acceptable currency. Unless something changed, one would emerge a winner and the other a guest of honor at a funeral. Blood payment was not Rome's official objective for the Ides, but for the enraged Delirio, hold on, I lost my mouse, sitting tied to a chair in the temple's subterranean room, tradition held little value. Every debt must be paid by the Ides of March, especially those men scheming behind muted implications. Welcome to 259 BC. Muted Implications is the thrilling 12th installment in the historical adventure series Clay Warrior Stories. Set in the framework of the first Punic War, the Clay Warrior Stories are historical adventures designed to make you want to strap on a shield, grab a gladius, and join a century's battle line. Warning, this is not the full-time Imperial Legion. This is the Mid-Republic's Levied Legion, and it is messy. Muted Implications is available in paperback, Kindle, and Kindle Unlimited by the one and only J. Clifton Slater. And I just want to mention, I killed that reading. I'm just going to I'm just gonna say that right now. I you killed it. You said right. Uh, I said Punic right. Uh, and then, right now, I'm going to put the link in the live chat so because i absolutely killed that reading you have to go and buy the book i mean that's the rule for the show if I josh if josh kills the ad read you uh have you have it. you have to buy it twice you have to buy it by the eyes of march yeah <laughs> which i know is an iron maiden song i think but i don't know that i don't yeah, know that uh also so we're going to talk about scrivener today uh um Matt is uh, somewhat of an expert on Scrivener. Uh, well, more of an expert than we are. He's written a book on Scrivener, and we are Scrivener affiliates. So if you'd like to ch- check out Scrivener on your own, you can go uh, follow this link in the live chat, and you can check it out. I think there's a 30-day free trial, which is actually 30 days. Like if you you log into it once, and then two weeks later, you log into it again. It's not that you've used the Scrivener the trial for two weeks you still have like another 30, 30 days, days on. of use yes so 30 days of use yeah. you, you get a, use it use it once a week you'd really spread that out <laughs> <laughs> i use it yeah. for 30 years for free i used it once a year that's like, right you've been very productive on those writing days <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh so yeah you can check out the uh, the link in the show it's an affiliate link we get uh, a little bit a little bit of the uh the purchase price if you do end up buying um, but it helps to support the show, as does buying Jake Clifton's book. Go do it right now. Uh, so talking about Scrivener, uh, last week we did a really super basic overview of how we use Scrivener. And this week we're going to talk about uh, the actual right way to use Scrivener. Uh, there is already a question in the chat. And maybe we'll cover this uh, really quick before we get into uh, your discussion on Scrivener so I don't lose it. Andrew Cole asks, is there a way to include section breaks like horizontal lines or a fancy graphic between sections yeah so the answer to that is while you're writing no but during (laughs) compile you can change the second section breaks to like three asterisks or um, insert images Uh, but the compiler is is pretty complex but i'm guessing you're asking while you while you're actually writing because that's where the the horizontal dashes occur uh and the answer is just no (laughs) it's not really meant to do that sort of um fancy visual stuff while you're writing it's really a a writing program not necessarily a book formatting program the book formatting is kind of a bonus they added on is it in i know the compile is uh super complex but is there uh is it is it more of a finding the right yeah yeah you have to find the right like there, there used to be and i haven't looked at it in a little bit there used to be like a field where you could type in the section break so yeah. you could paste in a symbol i used to use like the four dots or the three asterisks and it would center whatever you put in that field in the compile to separate scenes and i don't know if if, if this is just me or not but i saw i i work on a mac so i work on scrivener three and the, the difference between two and three in the compile was freaking ridiculous. And I, yeah, I thought, yeah. I, 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 and I, because of that, I haven't 
screwed around with the compile at all pretty much but in like scrivener yeah. too i could compile and i could do like the scene breaks that you're talking about and i could do a whole bunch of other stuff yeah. just because of how the the actual the, the ui of the compiler was laid out but in the new one in three i don't even know where anything is anymore so i'm just like whatever convert to word doc and then bring yeah. it over into vellum i use a default um i did briefly use uh, i made my own custom scrivener mac 3 one where it where it um, compiled the headings that are in your what do you call it the bar like above your document that like the note heading uh -huh. so that i could basically write an outline and have it print the outline like you said then i'd have the outline but then all i had to do was not click that function and it would just print without the outline but anyway I yeah, digress. Good. so the book I, I i wrote is called scrivener superpowers and it has a mac and a windows tutorial now scrivener from mac has been updated since then so the compiler ui in the book for mac is a little bit outdated the one for windows is still the same um and i know that i see a lot of people <laughs> saying ask uh, literature and latte, which is the company that makes Scrivener, when Scrivener 3 for Windows will be out. And the answer is it was supposed to be out last fall, but they keep pushing the beta. And that's why I haven't updated the book is because I wanted the parity between the, the system versions and they have not, um, yeah, so James says, I mean, sorta, they said it's coming out in 2020 last August and then they pushed it and then they pushed it and then they pushed it. So I don't that's know when it's gonna be out. That's probably what broke 2020 was the Scrivener it 3 be, for Windows. Yeah. Good it, job, LNL. You guys record, ruined it. <laughs> I, did put, I did put the link to your book in the live chat. So if people are curious cool. about that, they can, they can pick it up. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, like I said before, the compiler in Scrivener is really an add-on nice-to-have feature. It's not a compiling program. If you want something to make pretty eBooks, go use Vellum or... Yeah the other formatting programs, where Scrivener really excels is in the organization and the writing. And I'm sure you guys showed like the folder structure and stuff last week, so I won't go over that again. But that's really what it's for, is the actual drafting. So if you're using it for that, and you're using the power features, you are golden. If you use the compile, it's another level, level of like learning. It's possible. Right. But I personally don't even use it for compiling anymore. I just use Vellum. It takes me five minutes. I don't have to screw with the compiler UI. Right. Very confusing. Um, so and Vellum is so much more like the the interface for Vellum yeah. is so much easier to use than the compiler in Scrivener. Just just on a basic like like you're saying the section breaks. That's super easy to put in there. Barely yeah. an inconvenience. Like you could just go click yeah, click and it's there. It's built for that function, right? right. What happened was they built Scrivener to make it really good to write stuff in, and they were like, oh, let's let's add the compile afterwards. And what they did in Scrivener 3 was they fixed some of the metadata and code on the back end so that, because um, what used to happen in Scrivener 2 when you compiled, and I think it still does in Windows, is it inserts all this extra code, like extra CSS and HTML and styling that conflicts with uh, each other, right? So each, like, text file had its own styling and if you had a master file set there were conflicts so there was an issue where you were when you were uploading um like moby files generated from scrivener into kdp where the um previewer would actually be broken and you would have to contact kdp and have them go fix it so the, the nice thing about their compiler in scrivener 3 at least is that those issues are no longer a problem so, so when i wrote the book they were a big issue and uh and now it's it's not as much of an issue, but the new compiler UI, I think is a bit confusing. Yeah. But I thought what might be fun, if you guys are into it, um, because Scrivener 3 for Windows is gonna come out, I mean, eventually. Ish. Um, before the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, but those who are on Mac get uh, a lot of advanced features that Scrivener 2 for Windows doesn't have. So if you are brave enough to go grab the beta for Scrivener 3 for Windows, or patient enough to wait for them to release Scrivener 3 for Windows, then you can get access to all of these features as well. And I personally really like some of them. So um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here and I'll just show you guys the book I wrote. Um, started in December, finished it in July. Um, and because we were talking about outlining, I'll show you this too. So here's the first, you know, and I've got all these comments over here. So here's the first chapter of this book you can see I've got the color coding down the left, just one scene chapter, so I don't I love, need the whole love color coding. I can that's, show you guys. I think it's my favorite thing of Scrivener is the color, color coding. It's great. The labels are fantastic. You can customize them. So since this is a multiple point of view book, I've got four points of view. Each one is labeled here. And I had a prologue that I deleted, so that's what that fifth one is. But they're labeled and colored, and 
you know, if you want to use the I had a question about coloring, as a matter of yeah. fact, for the labels. So I do admit the in Scrivener three for Mac, when I do the coloring, as it appears in my site in, in the uh, binder, I guess, mm -hmm. it's always like a lighter pastel color than what it is that I select. So I'll, I'll pick uh, dark yeah. blue, but it comes out in like kind of this purplish pastel blue. Yeah. Actually, so what's the deal with that? Or is that it's just something you have no control over? I think it's, it has to do with ADA uh, compliance and legibility. So there are certain like um, ADA is the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. And there are certain like software compliance standards. So it's important for people to be able to read the text over top of the colors. Right. And the right. certain level of contrast is required for those standards to pass. So I, I've never actually talked to the developers about this, but I'm guessing that's why. Yeah. Um, whenever you see pale colors in an interface, like in you know Airtable or Trello or any other project management system, they're always kind of pale because if you put black text on them, it needs to have a high enough contrast to be read. You know, I'm totally down with that. It makes perfect sense because in the older versions, I would have some really brightly, probably yeah. impossible to read colors. But anyway, so. So they that, also have right here. So like if you go into view and use label color in, show background color, mm -hmm. that's the full like high contract, like uh, the full color, right? But right. when I go in here and I want to put it behind the text, it makes it a little softer. Yeah, right. So I like that, I like that a lot. I like, I like it when it covers the whole bar. But anyway, I interrupted a little bit, um, you were saying. Well, you guys were talking about outlining earlier. And this is this is as much of an outline as I get. So all these are is scenes with a couple, you know, a paragraph for each chapter or each scene. And you can change so this the size. Well. You can change the size of those cards and how many you are recorded. Yeah. So you could do like the spacing between them, the ratio of the cards if you want taller cards. Um, the cards. If you want to put a lot else. more in each card, you could make the card bigger or smaller. Is what I'm saying. Right. Exactly. So like, there's some big ones. Um, some of the cool stuff in in the new version, though, is this timeline feature. So here's a timeline for each um, character. So we use the labels to do the points of view. So this is Elia, Casey, and Kira, and um, this is the like a timeline that kind of goes across. So you can see which characters are in which order. I did not know you could do that. Yeah, there's a little button down here, so that's super cool. Um, this is arranged by label. You can also display it. writing time for the next three weeks, messing with timelines. So this is up and down. So that one's fun. Um, <laughs> this is as much outlining as I ever do is just, you know, a paragraph for each. And of course, I have a bunch of brainstorming notes and stuff. So I keep all that over here in folders, like my original plots, um, brainstorming transcripts, world building visuals, some research on you know ranks and missions and stuff. Um, and I used to keep my series Bibles in here, but I moved them out recently. So another cool um, feature, I'm gonna go down here. So you guys know how you can set project targets and Scrivener? Yep. So one thing they added from two to three that was great was a historical accounting of them. So you can go to writing history now and see your word counts from the past. They didn't Holy crap. This. It used to just be one day, and now you can get all of the past. How did you get that brought up? So it's um, projects writing history. See, that just solved me a lot of problem because I keep all these spreadsheets so that like if I, because if it, because Scrivener resets your thing if you don't That's update it, and I forget to put it in my spreadsheet, and then I can't figure out where it goes, but now I can just go back and look what I did yesterday and put it in my yep, spreadsheet. exactly. So you can always go back and look. I still think keeping a spreadsheet is is helpful, Scott. I still do yeah. that, too, because I want to see historicals not just from this project. So Scrivener's historicals are limited to the project. I want to well, see my whole year. And so with my spreadsheet, how I have it set up now is I have the project but then I have markers, like I have when the first drafts do, when the editor's draft do, when I need to have it done uh -huh. after the editor, when it goes up for pre-order, when it launches, when it promotes. Yeah. Um, I keep track of all that. But then I also compile how much, how many words I've written per day, how much time I've written per day, and then oh, wow. what my average is for every day. Because I want to keep, I want to have above three hours a day of writing. Right. Of quality writing. And right now I'm at about two hours and 66 minutes, or 2.66 That's cool. hours. 
Um, yeah, those, those sorts of tracking spreadsheets are good. Do you, do you find they illuminate some of your, you know, behavior and? Um, yeah, you know, well, I and, and it, without going on a huge sidebar, I was at uh, the Oklahoma Writers Federation conference a few, in 2016, I think, and there was a best-selling romance novelist, and she said, "If you show somebody who legitimately puts in 20 hours of real writing work every day, then 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 that person will will make it." Yeah. And I'm like. Well, I'm like 20 hours a week. Shit, that's a part-time job. I can do that. And I started tracking it. And I realized that for every four hours of writing, I was doing about 18 minutes of actual writing. Oh. So I keep very strict track of my actual writing. And I it's I I feel it's a what do they call it? It's a um uh a lead measure. It's a lead measure for success. And a lead measure for success is if you're consistently putting in enough quality time every single day. Right. Even if the word counts low that day, I can still say I worked four hours legitimately on my book. That's cool. I love that. I'm, I'm a big uh, data tracking nerd, so that sounds fun to me. So a couple other cool features I want to point out. So you know, sometimes those weird uh, spaces and and paragraphs come into Scrivener, so you can like zap the gremlins from them and strip the leading tags. Uh, tabs or remove empty lines between paragraphs. But what's more useful to me, oh, you can also trans do transformation. So before I compile or, or copy paste into Vellum, I'll go through and convert quotes to smart quotes so you don't have any of the dumb straight quotes in there if you want all smart quotes. So I have such a problem with that. Like it's ridiculous how big of a problem that is. Like if I copy is, and paste yeah. text from somewhere else and then I'll go like, I'll export it to word and half of them are curved and half of them are straight. I'm like, how did this happen? Or even sometimes like when you're typing, it'll show straight and then convert. Right. I don't know yeah. if you can see it on the screen share, but it goes straight and then converts. And sometimes they just don't. And I can't figure out why. Like sometimes I'll get a straight quote instead or yeah. they'll appear like, like they'll appear like this dialogue in here with them yeah. with the quotes in the wrong direction, right? Which is super annoying. It does, so it does that for me a lot on my if I use my phone, the quotes pointing in the wrong direction. So this will help a little bit. You still have to kind of look out for the little gremlins, but it'll help. Uh, the other thing, and these I think are super powerful. I love these. So they've had the name generator for a while. Yeah. But what they've added in Scrivener 3, and, and yes, I know Windows folks don't get yeah, these, yeah. but on the Mac, and do better is what again, I say. On Windows, if you go get the beta version of Scrivener 3, it works pretty well. So you could try that. But they added this linguistic focus feature. So what I like about this is if you're just working on, let's say you want to start removing adjectives. You're like, oh, I overuse adjectives. Holy crap. How'd you find that? Do edit writing tools, linguistic focus. And you can just focus on adjectives. Now I really like it because um, I like being able to see the direct speech. So this just shows you dialogue. So I can go through and just look at the conversation in this chapter. That might have been the coolest thing that's ever happened to me on this show. <laughs> this is great. I love this. That is insane. <laughs> and you can adjust the fade so it's almost vanished or vanished. And you can kind of bring it back up if you want the contrast. I like it about here just so I can see the dialogue. I can make sure it makes sense by itself and then write the description around it. Um, or, you know, if you're like, uh, if your editor gives you feedback, says, great story, but oh, look, here's one of those gremlin quotes. If your editor says, great story, but your dialogue's kind of wooden. You know, you could come in here and just do a dialogue edit. So that's pretty cool. That's insane. I love that feature. And I've got so one more for you. So when I was editing this book, um, I realized that I had multiple plot threads and I had a really hard time keeping track. So like there's these ancient powerful relics in this book. And I was like, which chapters are these things showing up in? I can't figure it out just by looking at the binder on the left-hand side. So if you use the custom metadata in Scrivener, you can actually add checkboxes that show you a certain quality so what I did is each one of these is a plot thread. Like there's the major mission. They have to evacuate this planet. There's the character um, arc for the main character. He's not acting like a team player. 
there's the artifacts, there's the mystery around who is this captain, there's the, the colonization board. So I just went through and check marked as I was going through my edit paths, and I didn't fix this, um, where each plot point was showing up. And this gave me a nice visual to be able to see, like, okay, if I wanna go you know, check out these, this particular plot thread, I can jump around based on these. So this is fun. And how does it track? So how does it know to check that? Is that something that you do manually, or is it just the metadata? Yeah, that you put yeah, that you in, the, you in so. the uh You put that in the the card because when you look at, I can't, I'm not looking at it right now, but you can put in there like you can label like first draft, draft complete, and yes. all those different things. Is that is that's where you do it, right? So out of here, you get label and you get status, right, by default, and you can edit these. So we edited the labels to use the point of view. Right. And we edited the status. Well, I edited the status so that I had to do in progress raw transcript. That's me pasting in for my transcription software. It's a mess. First pass, <laughs> second pass, third pass done. Yeah. Um, but then you can use, so it's this, it's in the inspector, right? Right. On the right hand side, there's the notes pane, the bookmarks pane, and then there's the metadata pane. And in the general, met, it's it's not general, but it's custom metadata. And you can go in here and add more custom metadata. So um, once you click this gear icon on, on Mac, you go into manage the custom metadata. And then I just added a field for each plot thread. So I go plot thread. And then it appears with a checkbox. And so I just go through and manually tick the boxes. On the That's front end, cool. it's a little bit of work, but on the back end, when you're trying to yeah. do like a, a revision That's or, right. or if you have to go back and do some developmental edits on the Because on the otherwise, I would have just opened a spreadsheet and done that way, you know, but I really wanted to keep it in here. And so once you have the metadata fields over here on the right, um, and so I'll click over to a scene that has them. So you can see for chapter 29, it's these two plot threads. And then if you want it to, so this is the outliner view. So again, you click on the folder. You see the text view, you see the card view. Oh, froze up on me. My computer sounds like a jet engine with uh, StreamYard <laughs> and the screen share running. But there's these three switchers up here. So text view, note card view. What you want is the outline view. And then if you right click on here, you can pick which columns show. So I just hit all the word counts. I hit all the, tar the progress, the right. all that stuff. And just to show me, this metadata for the plot threads and you know as i went through i just wrote down okay this is one plot thread this is another so i like the visual of it i'm a kind of visual person if i'm keeping track especially during revisions it's just really hard to track this stuff so this was a super useful feature well yeah it's it's interesting because if you you introduce a plot thread in in the beginning of your book and then you you don't see it checked at the back half of the book or later on in the book you either a need to figure out a way to include it in those other chapters or exactly. b just take it completely out of the book yep yep and i was like okay if i need to make a change to this plot thread which chapters do i even edit mm -hmm. you know now i have a list and i could say okay where does each of these plot threads wrap up and make sure there's a complete resolution for each plot thread in each one or you know open another box as you do that's amazing. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because uh, there's a lot of things where like I will outline stuff and put things in the books, but then I have to remember where is that in the book. Mm -hmm. and, and then I'm like, I'm looking at all, even the color codes and all that stuff that I have in my problem. I'm like, where did I include that in the book? And so even if it's like a one-off thing, I can include that in a metadata and see that that's that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a couple comments in the chat. Um, one I don't know if you can speak to or not. Uh, I think this is Scott McGlasson, but I'm not sure. Uh, the Scrivener features your uh, going over look cool enough for me to ask the unthinkable. How about running Scrivener 3 for Mac on a Mac emulator on a Windows 10 PC? You certainly could. Um, I've never tried it, but in theory, that would work. Um, there's also like, you know, the cloud software. Like if you're running Mac in the cloud, you could log on through Amazon S3, have your Mac in the cloud instance, install it there. I know people that have done that. I'm not sure it's worth the, the effort for everybody, but if that sounds like something you could do, um, it should work fine. But I would go check out the beta for Windows first because they do, um, Literature and Latte has a forum on their site for Scrivener where people ask questions and stuff. And they have a, a long thread about the beta. 
and they're continually updating it, right? Once the beta gets stable, they'll release it. The reason they haven't released it is because they don't feel it's stable yet. Um, but a lot of people are using the beta, so it might be worth trying. I wonder how hard it is to port from, I mean, they already have the program that's stable on Mac. I wonder why it's so hard just to port it's a, it to PC. It's, it's a totally different um, code base. They basically yeah. have to rewrite it. Um, because Windows apps are just different than, than Mac apps, and they, they're building a native app, right, rather than, like, a, an app with a web view. Um, yeah. I might be talking too technically now, but uh, I, I work in, just, just for background, I work for a marketing agency um, in the product design um, discipline. So I'm a content strategist, and we work on apps and websites. And so um, stop me if I say anything that doesn't make any freaking sense. But basically, when you build a, an app, you can do one of two things. You could build native functionality into the app with um, with the, the, the code base that they give you for Mac, or you could just build a web view, which basically means it's just a browser and they're loading a web page. And oh, so okay. the apps that do a web view tend to be a little bit slower, but they're easier to build. Hmm. Uh, Scrivener doesn't uh, can't really do that because they don't have a web view. So they have to rebuild the entire app. And I think that they just have like a really small team and it's just yeah. like more time than they expected. Somebody uh, on Facebook um, <laughs> says it because it's, because it's in alien runes on Mac. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, it's Scrivener. If you're, if you're not satisfied with the Windows version, it's 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 kind of a pricey proposition to get uh, to get the Mac and to run it on Mac and all that stuff uh, just strictly for writing. But like, I I bought a Mac to write on because I had to get away from PC gaming when I when I first started getting really serious about writing, and so the Mac was easy for me because it was really hard to play the PC games back when I bought the Mac. It was hard to play the PC games on Mac. Yeah, uh, That's why I made the original transition, uh, uh, and then I got Scrivener, so it made sense, but uh, yeah. Now you, now you can game on Macs a little bit more. Right. Now yeah, I have to be okay. way careful about it. Yeah. Well, they have Steam on a Mac now, so um, game over. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I know. God. <laughs> I know. Gosh, it's so hard. Yeah. What are the other features that aren't on um, Windows that people could expect to see in the Mac version that they may or may not know they're missing out on if they work in Windows? Those are the main ones that come to mind for me that are important. I mean, the compiler obviously is different too. And we can just show this real quick. It, it would require a whole session to do compile, yeah. but, you know. Um, the compiler is a little bit different here versus the Windows version. And I think it has a couple extra features. I, I don't even remember what the details are about those features, but you know, it is updated here. It's easier to control, I think, once you get it. Um, and there is more control, but yeah, it is kind of a pain. Can you go over really quickly, um, I know you say that you don't use Scrivener for the compiler and you just sure. compile and use on Vellum. Um, yeah. But when you do compile, how do you set that up? So it's, it, does it turn it into a word doc and, and what's the easiest way to do that? So it just comes out clean and you can either put it into Vellum or format okay. it in word. So the best thing to do, if you want to make sure it comes out clean is use Scrivener's templates. So if you go yeah. new project fiction, novel every scrivener install comes with these templates if you yeah. open the novel template and use that correctly right so let's just make a new one real quick okay. it'll have like folders and uh for the chapters and scenes so test novel that's top so if you use this and then you compile from the template it'll be basically already done for you and that's the best way that I know to get a consistent output from the compiler. Um, and if this ever loads, I'll show you what that structure looks like. Um, <laughs> then you can go into file compile and pick one of the templates and it'll just be done. So you can see here the manuscript, I, all of this stuff is just extra, right? They've got a front matter folder right. uh, for all the title page and copyright dedication and stuff. But really what matters is this here, um, the Manuscript. So you put chapters in folders and scenes within the chapters. This is really important because when they use the compile feature, it looks at the file structure to build the book. 
Yeah. And you give it, it's basically a rules engine. So you're saying to the rules engine, um, name the chapters after the folder names and within the chapters, place the scenes together and separate the scenes with this separator. And it's a series of rules that the compiler is, is given. So, you know, scene one, scene two, we'll just type some stuff in here. Scene two. And then if I want to duplicate this, I would do chapter two. And you can auto number these or whatever. Um, and then a couple's files. So this would be a book. You'd build out the chapters like this. Chapter one, chapter two, the scenes within the chapter. And then when you're ready, you go to compile. And I'm going to get beach balled for a minute. And then you basically just pick a style. So and let's pick a modern one. So then what you have to do is you have to assign each section a type. So they've already kind of done it for you because we're using the template. So it's saying that this chapter is a chapter heading and these are the scenes. And this is the chapter heading style and this is the scene style. You can see how this chapter heading corresponds to the section type. And this chapter or this uh, scene heading corresponds to the section type for scenes. And then you can even see the fancy break here. So what yeah. they've done when you edit this, oh, I have to duplicate and edit it. Oh. So scene, scene, yeah, I think it's this one. Oh, I don't want to edit it. So you can come in here and go to separators and there's your separator. So you can type whatever you want in here, and that's your custom separator. Oh, hey, there we go. We answered our question from the beginning. Look at that. Yeah, it is. We've come Look at that. Perfect. So, and you know, you can apply the text style, the layout, document title links. There's you know smart transformations. This thing is really complex, and this is one of the reasons that I personally prefer Vellum is because it's not as complex. Right. It's much easier. It's straightforward. It's simple. This thing is really powerful but it's very complex because it needs to do so many different things. It needs to be able to do manuscript format, modern format, paperbacks, proof copies, scripts. You know, it's, it's just got a lot in here. So they need to provide more flexibility so that their entire user base can use this, not just authors, right? It's not just fiction authors or nonfiction authors that are using this. There's right. graduate students that are using this to write their thesis. Um, there's script writers that are using it to write screenplays. So they need to provide more flexibility than something like Vellum can do. So yeah, there's definitely a learning curve on the compiler, but if you're willing to take the time and you use the templates, it'll be very easy. Um, but you can see that when I go to compile on my manuscript, because I just started with a blank one, because I know I'm not going to compile and I don't care, right. nothing is assigned correctly. Right. That's so, the way so, I, I start a blank one too, and then just kind of so, export it. Yeah. Right. So if I if I do that and I pick the default and I export it to Word and then like say I want the font change, I select all and change the font. That's you can actually change okay. the font in the compiler. You can you can do that. I know. I, I found that out the other. I I made like a custom one where it came out in Times New Roman, yeah, and some things like that. Yeah. So when you go in here, so I would uh, one of the nice things about Scrivener is that the fonts and the style of the editor is totally separated or divorced oh, cool. from the styles in the compiler. So whatever you want in the compiler, you would go in again to the let's do modern. Um, then we assign section layouts. And then you basically just, here, let's see if I can do it from this screen. Uh, this is like a, a modern sans serif font, right? So if I want to change this, duplicate and edit, and then you come down here and you change the font here. So I could change it from Avenir, which is the modern one, to, uh, oh, this one looks crazy, to Battlestar. And then the manuscript will compile to in the Battlestar font. To Word or whatever, and then you then you quickly do that in single space Battlestar font and send that to Ellen as your yeah. manuscript. She's going to she, love it. She likes it when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't so do that. Um, 
So yeah, yeah, you can definitely replace it on that level. The other thing that I heard, um, I haven't tried it, but I know people do it, uh, is you can actually compile to, is it, I think you have to select an ebook. No, you have to select docx, and then you get a vellum export. So I've this seen that, but I didn't know what that what the advantage. Oh, of that I didn't is. even know you had a vellum export. That's yeah, nice. they added it to the Word doc. So basically, they use the Word doc as a pass through. So you export yeah. it to a Word doc, and it does you know chapter, section, title. You can see the three dots. And for some reason, they've they've made this Word doc so that you can upload this straight into vellum, and it automatically. Well, breaks. and that's interesting right. because because I had when back when I was using the older version of Scrivener, I had put a lot of time into my compile. And I used it to compile my actual, you right. know, movies and stuff I did. Oh, and then I exported that into a Word and I uploaded a Vellum and it came out perfectly in Vellum. But the next, oh, right. all the other times I had to go in and like rename the tie, the head, the, the, right. the chapters and stuff. So maybe this would help that where I wouldn't have to go through those steps in Vellum. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it, it's it's really a pain. The, the compiler takes a lot of time. I used to do the same thing, manage all my ebooks in in Scrivener, and the extra like compile, tweak, compile, tweak, compile, tweak process is just very tedious. Vellum is yeah. like what you see is actually what you're getting, so it yeah. makes it a lot easier. Um, another thing that I kind of like to do, I like page view a little bit better. It makes me feel like I'm writing a book. Also kind of go in here and you can make the um, page a little bit smaller. So I usually go in here and make it a six by nine. Um, and then if you command shift and press period, you can kind of zoom in without making the font bigger. A lot of people would just go in here and make the font huge. They don't realize they can actually zoom in. Oh, nice. So this to me feels like a book because it's page view. Do the paragraphs here. You can see the page view has the break between them. Right. So I feel yeah. like, okay, I'm writing a book now. This is kind of how it's going to look in the final output. You know, right. I'll pick, uh, Cambria is like a nice serif font. So it kind of feels like a book to me. And then, of course, if you would like to see the chapter headings too, you can go in here and then view this as a text file. Now, th here's the dashes we were talking about earlier. Yep. Um, but if you go into view, text editing. So I'm going to show the titles. Oh, that looks like a book now. Nice. So in chapter, and if I edit chapter one here, it edits it there. And then oh, I have wow. the titles. And then I can go down here, chapter two. Then you can see, because there's nothing in these, and there's no title for the scene, because if I change this scene and go back, the, the dashes disappear. So maybe this is a nice way to um, format it. You just have to name the scenes and the dashes disappear, at least on, on Mac. So. Wow. I did not know that what either. What else do I use? I, honestly, like there's so many different features that I don't even touch, but I think those are the main ones. You know, if I, if I uh, use it for outlining, I'm using the synopsis, right, the top of the card. I use this notes pane, I use the comments. The other thing that actually is in both versions of Scrivener, new and old, Mac and Windows, is this snapshot. You guys ever use this snapshot? I use it a little bit. I don't really yeah, understand I, it. I use it occasionally. Um, I used it a lot when I was doing the first uh, Edge of Valor book. Right. Um, uh, I really like it, but I, I need to use it more because there's some days where I like don't use it at all, and then I can change old chapters, and I'm like, shit, I should have snapped out it. So what I do, you got, it's kind of tedious because you have to go through each scene and snapshot them. But what it does is it gives me peace of mind so that I can make revisions without fear of losing anything. Yeah. So at the end of a draft, like let's say I, I finished my first draft, I sent the book to an editor. I'll go through and snapshot each scene so that when I get the editorial notes back, I have the snapshot. And if I want to, I can then compare and see what I changed. Right. So you can see here what's actually been changed. And then if I need to, I can roll it back to this version. I'm not going to click this because this is actually a book I'm working on. But you can always roll it back. And so um, I used to be like really worried like, oh, what if, what if I change something or lose something that I would want? And I would you know, duplicate this scene and drag a version down. And then I would have to compare two scenes. It's really a pain in the neck. So I use yeah. the snapshot for each draft 
so that I can always roll back if needed. And spoiler, I've actually used it. I've made changes and gone, wow, that didn't work at all, and had to roll it back. So the click of a button versus. I also really like the revision mode um, oh, as opposed right. to attract changes. I'm doing my own stuff because I'll click on revision mode and all my changes are in red, and then revision two, all of the changes are in green, and and so on. And so, right. if That's I'm fair. if I'm taking apart a really complicated scene, that helps me because I can see what I changed. I've never and, used revision mode. Oh, I, I love it. Oh, I use I've it used time. it all the time. And then what I'll do is once I get it kind of where I want, then I just select all and make it all all the, the regular black font again. Yep. But it just the cool thing about revision mode is is like you can go in if you just change your font color and type it without being in revision mode. If you click somewhere else in the document and start talking, it just changes it back to the default black color. But in revision yeah. mode, you can click anywhere in the document and start typing, and it's always going to be in that revision color. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So if I click first revision here, and it's yeah, and then it's a lot faster than using track changes and stuff. When you're doing it just for yourself. Now with an editor, you probably want to do track changes, but so I can, it just makes it real. It's a really slick tool. Very simple. Uh, Tyler Davis in the Facebook um, area says uh, you can command shift all the scenes and then take a snapshot and it will do it without having to go in individually. Apparently. What? Command shift all the scenes. Well, I did that something similar i was working on on like kind of like richard fox does like all of one character's arc at one time while well, i hit uh, uh command select on all of that characters throughout my outline and then i could just write in those and they were all bunched together and then but then but they didn't move within the overall document and that mm. was super helpful that's cool but i'm not sure Ooh, if i did that stuff this is amazing <laughs> Well, look at that. Our 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 Scrivener expert is learning something on our Scrivener show. Yay! Yay! Right. Lightning yeah, has struck. Oh, that's yeah. cool. I knew they had this, but I've never used this one. And the snapshots remove all revisions. There and you go. can change you can change the revision color too. The uh sometimes oh, nice. the red is is too much for me, so I change it to a different color. But sure. I've uh I've used that when you look in my first edge of valor novel before i exported it anywhere there were some scenes that had like six different revision colors <laughs> i was just like yeah i gotta go in and change it all yeah well anything else you guys want to see or demo or you know again i think that this program is amazing and i don't even need to use all of the features but there's stuff that's useful to different people so i think, well, I think that's Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. I said I think it'd be neat if we kind of made a list of topics that, that people have asked in the chat and then did like some short like one offs, like 15 minutes on just on, you know, one yeah. thing. And then we can then we can block those up and make a library of them for everybody that watches the show. That's a cool it'd be, idea. It'd be very useful. Yeah. It's like yeah. real focused, short, shorter things we could uh -huh. do. Well, and the short videos are so useful. It's a great way to demonstrate software. Much better. I mean, a book's nice because you can have the book as a reference file next to you, but there's nothing like videos for learning software. Yeah, when you want one problem fixed, you want it probably the shorter video, the better. So you can just get it done. Plus, you can see it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've talked to people who've read the book I wrote and gone, I still don't know how to do this. Right. And once I show them, like sit down next to them, and go, okay, you click here and you do this. They go, oh, light bulb. You yeah. know, it's just something about software. It's such a visual medium. We need to be shown. Uh, yeah. In the live chat, Silent Wolf asks, uh, how do you deal with Word doc revisions from an editor bringing them back into Scrivener? <laughs> yeah, so that's such a pain in the neck. I Sometimes it depends what I feel like doing. Sometimes I will manually port them back. Real time suck. I hate what, it. What, what Most I do, of the time, I just right. work in the doc, right? Once once it goes to an editor and it's in a Word doc, we're working in the doc now. Yeah, so that's what I do is I work in the document, but when I have the absolute 100% final, final, final version that's been published, then I import that back into Scrivener for my archive of completed. That way, when I write book three, I can see right there the final, final, final book one and book two, and I can search those as I write book three and it's very so, useful. Scott, when you do that, do you put them back in the original manuscript file? I put, I put them, I put them right below um, the research bar. Oh, okay. So as a separate folder. Yeah. And so, so then I, I yeah. 
right. And so yeah. then I'll, I'll, I can work on, I'll split my screen vertically. I'll work on my current project on the left side of my screen and I sure. can pull up all of the, all of the previous series on the right um, in the, in the manuscript mode. And then I can search like for a character name or did this person lose, you know, like missing hand, you know, and I'll search all the books to see if they miss or missing their left hand or whatever. Yeah. Um, it was very useful. I definitely love the split screen mode. It's it's super useful when you're editing. Yeah. And and like so sometimes I'll do the split screen mode, I'll do cards on the one side of the split screen with all my note cards and then what I'm writing on on the other side. Do you guys so, see what I use in this notes pane for? <laughs> how the flip do they know where the phrase is gonna <laughs> nice? That was me. <laughs> I have no idea how this is gonna work. Yeah, I, I do that. I, I love the notes. A lot of times if I'm doing big scenes with a lot of characters, I'll write out which characters are in the scene in the notes and then where they're at. And so that way, if I get lost in the document, I can just look in the notes and see. Yeah. The other thing um, is neat about the notes is the notes, the, the yellow bar there on the bottom right, talking about notes, it's formatable. So I, I will make that different colors or different sizes because since I'm half blind and I'm working on a small screen, I will make my notes and I'll make those super big so I can read them easily if I have big notes and stuff. You can also look at all of your um, track changes bubbles in that sidebar, which is useful as well. Yeah. One of the things that I don't, I, we didn't touch on is uh, comments. Um, yeah, that's what I meant, comments. In, in, in the in the manuscript and you can, the cool thing about comments is you can highlight what you're talking about and make a new comment and it shows over in the, in the binder, you can change the color of those comments. Mm -hmm. And then if you click on the comment, it will take you to the, the place. And like, if you're at the beginning yeah. of the chapter and you're not looking at the comment and you click on it, it'll take you to that place. And so I use a lot of that. If I'm, if I'm drafting, and I do this a lot in, in Google Docs too, but it's so much easier to do it in Scrivener. And it's I way forget more functional. if I know, like I forget a name of a character or a name of a ship or whatever, I'll just type in all caps name and then highlight and add a comment and mm. then say, I need a name there and just keep writing. Well, then when I go back to, to do my final edit before I port it, as I do it a little bit differently, I'll do all the writing in Scrivener. I have all these comments to fix as I'm doing a developmental. And mm -hmm. then as I clear out all the comments, the icons on the uh, scenes, I change when, I, when I'm done drafting, I change all the icons to an open box yes. and then go through every chapter. And as I go through every chapter, I'll change it to the check tick box. So I know as I'm going through which chapters I've finished the developmental edit in. Mm -hmm. And then, and then transport everything to Word, and then I don't ever bring it back. As soon when I take it to Word, I'm done at Scrivener, and then I'll do like edits and all that in in, in Word. Yeah. But I absolutely love that comment feature because you can go through and just click super easily. You go, you change it, and then um, that that helps me in the drafting process. Like you said, like I use Scrivener to write the book the easiest way that I've found to write the book. And um, I mean, I don't do, I, I send it to Steve and Athon and they do all the formatting and ebook sure. and print and all that stuff. I don't, I don't deal with that. I just like to, to have the, the ease of composition. And that's what I think Scrivener is the best at is, is composing and, and situating things best way for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They also, I know you said you use it for names. Like if you don't know a character name, you might, put name yeah and, and then highlight it here yep. and then we'll add a comment another way to do this which um, again is in both versions of scrivener and the new and old is you can go into i had just found it edit view okay in insert inline annotation and it'll put a red box around it it doesn't add a comment but it, it clearly calls it out and it's actually in the system. So if I go edit, find, um, and search in product, oh. no. Where'd the search in project go? Edit, find. Huh. Doesn't My search. That's weird because <laughs> my, my search and project is usually at the top uh, right corner. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Oh, yours is on the top left. I moved it. Search options. 
Uh, I was pretty sure you could search these. I, I might have just put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> oh, here you go. Find by formatting. Here it is. Inline annotations. So you can actually find the inline oh. annotations afterwards. Nice. Same thing with comments and footnotes. Anyways, it's just another way to do that same sort of thing. Right. I think it's Command Shift A too. So if I ever want to come back, it's like, oh, I got to rename these aliens. I might Command Shift A on them and come back to them. Yeah. Um, nice. There was one more. I could remember what it was. The name generator is cool. I don't know if you guys have used that. Boom, names. I have not used the name generator. I've used it a couple times. Um, uh, and it's 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 very good. A lot of times I'll use, there's a, a website that I go to that has basically names for like everything you could possibly think of in like writing, like the spaceships or aliens or plants or like anything you need, it'll come up with ideas. And then uh, either I take them wholesale or I use them. Like I split them up and I'll use like last name from this one or first name from this one. Yeah. Those are fun. I love those. Uh, especially if they're like genre specific, it always helps. Right. Um, well, we've, we've gone over a little bit and that's fine. Uh, whenever we talk about Scrivener or, uh, compiling, it's always, a uh, an interesting show. And, and, uh, I've learned uh, that timeline feature is going to just, I mean, it's going to, it's, it's, there's, there's so much that I, you can go back and watch this episode and get some, some really good nuggets of information. Um, but really, like we said last week, uh, Scrivener is such a big program that it will, take you a really long time to find all the features to really learn all the features and master all the features but if you're just looking to write you can do it super easily uh with scrivener and uh in a very innovative innovative um way here in the program instead of just using word and having one big huge document that'll gobble your system resources and crash your computer it's very very customizable that's that's the thing yeah. And as with any productivity tool, um, just be careful that the tool doesn't take up all your productive time, right? right? There's a point where the bright, shiny object becomes a bright, shiny object and not a tool anymore. Right. So yeah. uh, fair word of warning. If you find yourself spending too much time in it, I would take a step. Like too much time in the compiler is a great example. Yeah. Is this the best use of my time or should I just do something different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kind of like getting Photoshop and starting to make your own book cover. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh well, Matt, thanks to, so much for coming on the show and and yeah, good times. Yeah, laying down that. your Scrivener knowledge. I know that there's a there's another program that you want to talk about and hopefully we can get you on soon. It's called Notion. Yeah. So right? I started using this tool called Notion to build out series Bibles. And actually I moved all my word count tracking because I had stuff in multiple spreadsheets like like you do, Scott. And yeah. multiple Word docs. I have like all my book descriptions and Word docs. I moved everything into Notion. Um, and it's pretty cool just as a as a project management tool. But um, the series Bibles are nice because uh, you know, if you're writing a long series, you gotta keep track of character names and settings and such, a world building aspect. So that's fun, it's very visual. Um, also, Notion has a free tier, so anybody can go check it out. But oh, nice. happy to come back and talk about that if there is interest. Yeah, no, I, I I'm always keen to learn new uh -huh. uh, programs because then, like I I, I downloaded Aeon Timeline the other day for a oh, project cool. and uh, spent probably a couple of days learning the the program. But always go to YouTube to find the stuff. So if if uh, we can learn new stuff, um, I'm always I'm always down for that. Fun. So basically, I'll try Notion out. I'll plug Josh with questions until he throws <laughs> up his hands, and then we'll call Matt. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like we already have interest. Uh, Andrew Cole uh, would like to talk about it. So uh, we're definitely going to have you back on to talk about that. Awesome. Um, but yeah, thanks uh, for fielding our questions. And everybody in the live chat, thank you for joining us on this Monday morning and uh, hanging out with us. Uh, Thursday is still, they're still on vacation, the writer's journey. I, I'm not sure when they're coming back. I think it's like two weeks they're coming back. Uh, tomorrow, I think Walt Rebillard will be uh, live with co coffee and concepts. And then we'll be back next week. But I have no idea what we're doing because I'm very organized. And that's how I do things on the show. Next week, 
our own version of coughing concept, we could talk about my Keurig malfunction right before the show started. <laughs> so I've had exploding Keurig cups lately. Good times. I'm telling you, if you haven't tried it, you really should. Which co coincidentally is not exactly how you make great coffee. It's having no, it's exploding. Not. It's like the opposite. What is yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. uh, thank yeah. you, everybody, for – let's see. Oh, Kayleen says that the writer's journey comes back 9-3-202. I'm just kidding. 2020. Nine. <laughs> yeah. Nine, uh, three. Uh, so what is that? Two weeks from now? Yeah. Uh, so good times. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us. Matt, again, thank you so much for spending your Monday morning with us. And we will come back next week. We're going to talk about some reading, some writing, and, of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. See you. Still alive. <laughs>